It's been a while, I know, but we are back with another episode of That Racing History Podcast, the show that takes the history of motorsport, edits it down into 20-minute or so chunks, and then sends it to your ears with a smooth jazz intro that is the perfect way to feed your motorsport addiction. My name is Adam Ord, and while this series usually covers teams, cars, races, and people, today I'm looking at a nation that, despite its small size, has managed to somehow become the world leader in all things motorsport. And that nation is this one, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. A small group of islands in the North Atlantic that's the home to Shakespeare, English, the Beatles, fish and chips, and football. But it's no secret that since the heyday of about 150 years ago, things have changed. The once world-beating navy? Scaled down. The world-famous air force? Same thing. Our relationship with the Continentals? Destroyed. The largest empire the planet had ever seen. Well, that ended in 1997 when we handed Hong Kong back. Britain is a small island group that, despite its location in northwestern Europe, has given birth to the world's most brilliant minds, artists and merchants that gave us power and wealth way beyond our meagre numbers. I knew the intro to Civilization V would come in useful one day. Now, I don't want this to become a my country's better than you type of thing or get political. It's a fact that one thing that we seem to do pretty damn well is build racing cars. But the question is, why here? When the Germans have their reputation for precision, the French were the pioneers of car racing, Italy is the home of the performance car, and the United States has the likes of Ford and GM. So to begin the story properly, we need to go back to about 1945. The Second World War had just ended, and Britain faced a massive rebuilding job. Furthermore, the pilots that had flown the Spitfires, Lancasters and Hurricanes were suddenly out of work. The mechanics that kept them flying were surplus to requirements, and the men that designed those aircraft had no more work to do since the arms race against Hitler had finished. So the designers started designing racing cars, because they discovered that there were a lot of old airfields knocking about with very long runways. The mechanics built these racing cars, and the pilots... you get the idea. And also, to quote Damon Hill, being seen to do something brave following the Second World War was the thing to do. Much like children grew up in the 1960s wanted to be astronauts. My generation wanted to be Pokemon trainers or David Beckham, and people today want to be YouTubers. Get off my turf. It has to be said, though, that in the period following the war, Britain had a very big motor industry. The Spitfires that fought in the Battle of Britain were built in what is now the Jaguar Land Rover plant in Castle Bromwich, Birmingham. By 1955, five companies were producing 90% of the vehicles made in the UK. BMC, Ford UK, Roots, Triumph and Vauxhall. Rover and Jaguar, and MG as well, they were a bit more niche. And By 1960, Britain had gone from second in the production table to third. Japanese and European cars were cheaper to build and cheaper to sell. So soon, Renaults, Citroëns, Peugeots, Toyotas and Nissans, well, Datsuns, were taking over from the homemade product. In the early 1950s, German cars started appearing. Although, if you owned a Volkswagen Beetle in Britain in the early 50s, it wouldn't be long before someone had smashed it up, because... The war. I mean, you only had to see that British Leyland episode of Top Gear to see how bad our cars could be. And like I said, Britain also found itself with a lot of disused airfields lying around after the war, particularly in the eastern portion of the country in places such as Lincolnshire and Norfolk, the former being known even today as Bomber County. In fact, out of the current major race circuits in the UK, Snetterton, Croft, Thruxton, the Top Gear Test Track at Dunsfold and Silverstone are all former RAF airfields and many more disused airfields have become home to driving experience days, karting clubs and vehicle testing centres because of the taxiways and runways being straight and easily configurable for circuit and drag racing. Then when Formula 1 became a world championship in 1950, 12 of the drivers were British and many of them had fought in the Second World War. With the beginnings of the British Saloon Car Championship in 1958, which is now the British Touring Car Championship, the R&D departments of these companies were trying to apply race technology to the roads to improve performance and reliability, and then use the BTCC to win on Sunday and sell on Monday. But by the early 1960s, the major manufacturers in Mercedes, who pulled out of racing altogether after the 1955 Le Mans disaster, Alfa Romeo, Auto Union, 
Audi, basically, and Maserati had all pulled out. Leaving Enzo Ferrari with an almost monopoly on the sport given that he had the most staff, the biggest budget and the most advanced facilities. Leaving him to crush the recent influx of small British teams that decided to join Formula 1. And Enzo referred to them by the derogatory term, Garage Easters. The Garage Teams, given that most of the cars were built in sheds or small industrial units, each one personifying the British trait of being innovative in the field of engineering. Enzo must have been rubbing his hands with glee because if there was one thing Enzo loved doing, it was winning. But I would have loved to have seen his face when Sterling Moss won the 1958 Argentine Grand Prix in Henry Cooper's rear engine car, which became standardised a few years later and led to the mid-engine cars that we see today. Possibly the most famous of these garage easters was a man named Colin Chapman, a man ahead of his time and the man who not necessarily invented stuff because he was a little bit of a Thomas Edison, he'd take other people's ideas and claim them as his own, but he certainly became the main guy when it came to things that all open-wheel disciplines now use. Mid-engine construction, monocoque chassis, sponsorship, exploitation of power-to-weight ratios, and downforce. And Enzo was eating his words as he only won the Constructors' Championship in 1961 and 1964, but then struck gold with Nicky Lauder in 1975. And with Colin Chapman at the helm, Lotus went on to shape modern motorsport, because Lotus realised if they stuck the engine in the middle, the weight was better distributed and the car was more stable in corners. If they stripped all the excess weight out of the car, the power to weight ratio went up, meaning the car accelerated quicker and was easier to slow down. The car was fragile as a result, but a lot of the garage easters adopted a similar approach, and in 1962, Graham Hill won the driver's title while BRM picked up the constructor spoils. It was the first time a British driver in a British car had won the championship. Ferrari was sixth behind Porsche, and the top four teams were all British privateers. But having dominated the 1961 season, Enzo Ferrari was suitably embarrassed when his demands of perfection resulted in the Great Walkout, which was just a massive strike taken by his workers. Enzo believed that the V8 used by the British teams was the answer, and that was adopted in 1964 for John Surtees' title. This was the same year that the North American racing team ran Ferraris on behalf of Enzo because he was having a little bit of beef with Italian racing authorities. The Italian racing authorities didn't believe in mid-engine cars. In 1965 though, Ferrari switched to a flat 12. The engine was too heavy and as a result, Jim Clark in a Lotus that was using the same Climax engine it had been running for the last few years, dominated the season. In fact, Clark actually took 100% of the available points on offer because of drop scores and things like that. In 1967, the 3-litre engine formula came in, and Lotus continued with their lightweight mid-engine V8-powered cars. This was also the first year of the iconic Ford DFV V8 engine, purpose-built for the car to be designed around. And because Chapman's cars were notoriously fragile, it failed to win the World Championship. But the DFV became the engine to have. Then in 1968, it was genesis for modern motorsport as we know it. Not only did sponsorship liveries turn up, but Chapman began experimenting with wings. Chapman, being a pilot, realised that his plane stayed in the air because of the high pressure under the wings. Whichever way around it is, he, he realised that if he flipped the wing upside down, it would push the car into the ground and you'd get more friction and more grip in high-speed corners. Lotus and Graham Hill would dominate the season, but their success was tainted by the tragic death of Jim Clark. The experiments with these new wings led Enzo Ferrari to say... Aerodynamics are for people who cannot build engines. At around the same time, it was the height of the space race between the US and the Soviet Union, and the British and French aviation companies were developing the legendary supersonic airliner, Concorde. Unlike Formula One cars, Concorde was using advanced aerodynamic properties to ensure it hit its maximum cruise speed of Mach 2. Think of it this way. If you wave your hand through the air at slow speed, it's effortless. This is the same as driving your road car through town at 30 miles an hour. If you do it faster, you can feel the air resistance against your hand. Driving a car at 150 is like trying to do the 100 meter sprint in a swimming pool, and reaching 230, which is the top speed of a modern Formula 1 car, it's like trying to do that same 100 meter sprint in a pool of sticky golden syrup. This is why Concorde, the SR71, most fighter jets and Formula 1 cars, at least until recently, are small, sleek and compact to punch an effective hole in the air. It's also why cars like the Bugatti Veyron need a 9 million horsepower engine because it needs to punch that hole in the air that's basically treacle at those speeds. And as we've heard probably a million times on TV by now, the faster a Formula 1 car is going, the more air passes over the aerodynamic parts and you get more grip. 
Yes, they have massively powerful engines, but the more aerodynamic efficiency an object has, the less fuel is used and top speed increases as it slips through the air. Everything we see on a Formula 1 car today was kick-started by British engineers in the late 1960s. The record books for Formula 1 will show that in total there have been 10 world champions from the United Kingdom. Four of those drivers have won it twice or more. In addition, British drivers have won the top prize in other forms of motorsport, from single seats to rally, oval and endurance racing. For the YouTube version of the podcast, I've put a bunch of them on the screen for you. Another fun fact, when it comes to F1 world champions per capita, that title actually goes to Finland. As for the Formula 1 Constructors' Championship, British registered teams have won the title a total of 33 times, since the Constructors' Championship was formed in 1958. If you take cars built in the United Kingdom, the list is even longer. You add in 2 for Renault, 4 for Red Bull and 7 for Mercedes, and that takes that number up to 46. Ferrari has achieved 16 just on its own, which is a phenomenal statistic. But aside from Ferrari, only one other championship has been won by a car built outside of the UK. And that was Matra in 1969. The car was built in France. So, why here? Our motor industry is dead. Honda's Swindon plant will be gone soon. Austin, Hillman, Jensen, Lanchester, Morris, Napier, Reliant, Talbot, gone. Rover was bought by BMW in the early 21st century and died. BMW has taken over production of the legendary Mini, and Rover and MG have since been reborn under Chinese ownership. When the new Chinese MGs and Rovers are better than the Rover 25 my dad had in 2002, then the ones built here must have been crap. Probably because the brummie who worked at Longbridge was always on strike, while the Chinese guy building it in... wherever it is, actually does his job. But even with the British marks still active... Rolls-Royce is under BMW. Bentleys are still built in crew, but under Volkswagen. Jaguar and Land Rover are owned by the Indian Tata Group. Lotus was owned by the Malaysian Proton Company, but is now owned by the Chinese, as is the reborn LDV. Vauxhall is under Peugeot Citroën ownership because GM didn't want to be in the right-hand drive market anymore, Rip Holden, and Aston Martins are fueled by maple syrup. So why racing cars are not road cars? It's a self-reinforcing cycle. When a team goes bust, someone can buy the assets to save time, money and reduce risk. For instance, BAR bought Tyrrell, which was then bought by Honda, which became Braun, and the Braun team was bought by Mercedes. That's probably the most famous example, at least over a long period of time, because that goes back to the late 1960s. Other examples include Red Bull, which was once the Stewart team, the Ford factory team back in the late 1990s. Aston Martin was Jordan when I was a kid, and Alpha Tauri was once Bernardi. Britain has a Silicon Valley for motorsport. If you plot a point from Birmingham southeast towards London, take another line across to Bristol and then back up the M5 to Birmingham, you'll find most of Britain's major motor racing manufacturers within it, most being in the region of the M1 and the M40. You have Williams based in Grove in Oxfordshire. You have the Renault Formula 1 team in Enstone near Chipping Norton, also in Oxfordshire. Mercedes, despite being a German company, has its base in Brackley, the engines are built at the old Ilmore factory in Bricksworth. Aston Martin occupies the former Jordan factory at Silverstone. Red Bull have the former Stewart and Jaguar factory in Milton Keynes. Haas have a secondary HQ in the UK located in Banbury, which I believe is the old Marussia factory. And McLaren is just outside of the motorsport zone in Woking in Surrey. And other outfits in that zone include ProDrive, Aston Martin, Rimstock, Team Dynamics, x Cosworth and others. But even Ferrari has employed several British personnel over the years that have contributed to the success of the team. Many of them very well-known names within the sport, such as Ross Braun from Manchester, Rob Smedley from Middlesbrough, and John Barnard from London. And for some more bonus facts, for a period in the 1990s, Barnard was designing Ferrari F1 cars from an office in the UK. In the 1997 Formula 1 season, all of the cars had been designed in the UK, with the exception of Minardi and Sauber. Former BBC pundit and Jordan employee Gary Anderson said, The area around Silverstone was a handy place to be. You could go there and do testing and it was well located in terms of major roads and airports, such as the M1, the M40, the M6, the M5 and East Midlands Airport. So is it safe to say that it's because of dense population? He added, If you were serious about motor racing, you had to be in that area, so teams and suppliers started to move there to form a hub of industry. 
And with several teams located within two hours of each other, it also means that the best engineers can live in one place. People can move teams very easily because they don't have to move house and home. The downside for the teams is that while they have access to a huge talent pool of people, those same people can be poached. But it's tougher for teams like Alfa Romeo who are based in Switzerland to attract good people because it will involve a massive life change for those involved. Ruth Buscom, a British strategist, is one of those people. Now, there are almost 3,500 companies associated with motorsport in Motorsport Valley, which is a name that is actually trademarked, and it employs around 40,000 people, which represents about 80% of the world's high-performance engineers. These same engineers could have worked for BAE, they could have worked for Airbus, they could have worked for the European Space Agency, but they chose to build racing cars instead. The government has latched onto this and it continues to supply funding and incentives to encourage individuals and companies to push the boundaries of innovation in an area similar to Silicon Valley or the City of London or even Manhattan in terms of development. In 2008, the then Labour government set aside £3.5 billion in funding for transport improvements and the development of centres of technical excellence. Ford has one. It's massive. But we shouldn't just stop at Formula One because components are sourced from Britain and supplied to a series all over the world. X-Track is the preferred transmission supplier for the IMSA Sports Car Championship, the SCCA GT and GTS categories, supplies to NASCAR Sprint Cup and NASCAR Xfinity Series, and above that, they are the exclusive supplier of gearboxes and transmission systems for the BTCC, TC2000 and Super TC2000 in South America, the Marcas Series in Brazil, World Touring Cars, TN in Argentina, and many other national and international series benefiting from those systems. They also supplied the hybrid systems for several Le Mans teams, including Audi and Porsche, that were dominating in the early 2000s. And it doesn't just stop at those, because the Australian Supercar Series might have most of the cars built in Victoria or New South Wales, but some of the control parts, like the brakes, come from Coventry. The rims are from Rimstock in Wensbury, next to my old office, and that is owned by Steve and Matt Neal, who run Team Dynamics in the BTCC, which was the Honda factory team until 2021. ProDrive, the company that built Colin McRae's Subaru Impreza rally car, has a branch in Australia that runs Ford Mustangs as part of the Supercars Championship. Since the Formula One World Championship started in 1950, the British motorsport industry is now worth billions to the British government and employs over 40,000 people. And the industry continues to grow, with companies in Motorsport Valley producing an estimated turnover of £6 billion, of which £3.6 billion of that is exported. And despite the economic climate and Brexit, motorsport-based businesses spend 30% of their turnover on research and development to stay ahead of the competition. That compares to 4% in engineering, 6% in automotive, and 15% in pharmaceuticals. Teams such as Williams have helped develop hybrid systems for non-motorsport use, and recently helped develop a pod to safely transport critically ill babies. And during the recent pandemic, teams turned to developing ventilators just in case the hospitals became overwhelmed. The results are clear to see on track, with all but one of the races in Formula 1 in 2020 won by a British-built car. British-based constructors have won 46 Constructors' Championships since the Constructors' Championship was started in 1958, which is well clear of Italy with 16 and France with just one. If that continues and the supplies continue to deliver, Britain looks set to remain home to much of the motorsport fraternity for many years to come. And this story isn't one that has a definite end like most of the others. This one keeps on going. And if you think about it, maybe the story here has only just begun. It's probably not much of a story either because this is a lot more investigation into stuff like, you know, my Pressing Issues series. So, uh, what's this? That Racing History Pressing Issues. There's not a lot we're good at. We can't play football anymore. Rugby team's crap. Well, I guess we won the Cricket World Cup, but who cares about cricket? But it's interesting to me at least. Not a lot we're good at, but we know how to make a car go broom. So despite all the investigative journalism he bits and pieces. I do hope you enjoyed this one because it's definitely interesting to see how this little island became the most successful motorsport nation and why a lot of the F1 teams want to be based here. And if you did find it interesting, like the video on the YouTube version so I know that it was interesting. And if you want to learn more about the history of F1 and other series, the drivers, the people, the tracks, the cars, whatever, you can follow this series on Spotify so you can listen on the go and subscribe with the bell on with the YouTube upload so you get all the latest. 
That Racing History Podcast is a Patreon-backed show, and if you wish to help support this podcast or just my YouTube channel in general at a more personal level, then you can do so by heading to the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Aidan Millward. That's A-I-D-A-N-M-I-L-L-W-A-R-D. So Aidan with an A and not an E. And you can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and all that good stuff. And there is also a Discord where you can join in the chat there. For YouTube listeners, all that stuff is handily in the description box for you. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mild with That Racing History Podcast. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. <laughs>